to get, you need to be um, um, covering those learning outcomes. So by the end of this lecture, you need to ask yourself, do I know this or not? So do I know what is the pharmacogenetics? What is pharmacogenomics? What are the difference between them? Um, how come they are interchangeable as terminologies? Some other terminologies like precision medicines or personalized medicines and some other related terminologies. Just to understand, um, in a perfect world, you should have taken that in a couple of years back, but now that we're catching up, so you're going to be seeing me and seeing other professors taking in every once in a while, you know, aligning you back with the topic of the pharmacogenomics and how it is applied within uh, our practice in general, whether hospital um, level or community level or even research level. But the second thing would to be to be able to demonstrate the understanding and connect between what is the PK, what is the PD, and what is the PGX. So what is kinetics, dynamics, and genomics, and how they relate to each other, and how can you apply that in what we call precision medicine or personalized medicine today when it relates to the opioids and non-opioids analgesics. And um, there are resources, as we have resources for everything. There are resources to get information about pharmacogenomics data uh, and decisions and clinical um, decisions about that. And this includes what we call CPIC, and we will have some hands on, on it today, um, and what we call PharmGKB or um, Chop All website. Um, how to integrate that into actually uh, formulating a, a decision, a therapeutic decision to change a dose or, or to adjust therapy for a patient or to choose which medication is best for them. This is also something else that we will be looking at. Those are some sorts of references. Uh, one of them is a book, another one is an online course, and some of them are uh, Farm GKB uh, links, and we'll see how to reach out for that today. Um, so what is personalized medicine? Okay, uh, let me just make it a little bit bigger now. Okay, so Basically, personalized medicine is instead of one uh, medication fit all or one therapy or one size therapy fits all. So for example, let's start by the empiric therapy. Let's give 100 milligram uh, of this medication three times a day, and that's it. Um, actually, when we do that to patients, we see that some patients see good clinical effect. Some other patients see toxic effect, but no clinical effect. Some people get the effects and the side effects, and some people get no effect at all, as if they got a, a cup of water, actually. They didn't take the medication altogether. So um, when we say personalized medicine, we're adjusting doses to each of those groups. Okay? Um, so this is, uh, so precision medicine is an emerging approach for disease treatment and prevention. So basically for treatment and this is what we are going to be focusing on, but it's also for prevention because sometimes it's used in diagnostic as diagnostic tools. Okay, not simply like the the, the knowledge of the genes and the G DNA um, is also used in diagnostics, prevent a disease. Uh, to know that the, uh, some patients are inheritable of certain diseases, as such they can prevent it, etc. But what we're focusing on today is the pharmacogenomics from a term of um, um, therapy. Okay, um, so although the term precision medicine and personalized medicine are quite interchangeable, but some people would think that uh, personalized means I have to individualize therapy to each specific patient, and this is not exactly right. Okay? Um, we are talking about grouping people into groups that have similar identities, and this is how we actually uh, identify the, the, the patients. Um, so if I want to ask you now, what is, the, uh, what is the difference between precision medicine and personalized medicine? Is there any difference about that? Anyone? You can open the, uh, you can unmute or write in the, in the, um, The chat. Okay. Okay. So the question. The question is. Uh, um, the question is. How, what is the difference between precision medicine and personalized medicine? Is there any difference? Are those terms interchangeable?
yes, those terms, yes, exactly, those terms are interchangeable, okay? And, and, and why they are interchangeable? Because basically they look at precision medicine into a more recent definition, because precision medicine, some sort of um, um, gets out of the idea that personalized mean I have to design the therapy for each individual. Um, and it doesn't make sense to imagine each individual, you need to adjust the therapy for one individual at a time. How come I would get enough clinical data, enough clinical uh, settings for that? So this is not true, okay? So instead of that, we group the people into three, four, five groups that exhibit similar DNA characteristics, uh, similar uh, uh, polymorphisms. And based on that, we start dividing them into those groups and adjusting the therapy according to that. And that's why personalized medicine despise, it is personalized, but it is not per person, but per group of persons that exhibit similar characteristics, okay? So those are some sorts of definitions. Okay. Okay, so now let's go for another definition. What is pharmacogenetics? Anybody can define what is pharmacogenetics? Have you heard this term before? Anybody heard the term pharmacogenetics before? Yes, okay, so what does it imply? When you hear pharmacogenetics, what does it mean? Exactly, some alterations, some mutations, some polymorphisms in the DNA sequences. This is the DNA part. But what, when I say pharmacogenetics, there is a, another thing. Exactly, which how a person genetics impacts the PK and the PD. So for example, let's say, let's say um, um, that uh, a certain polymorphism uh, resulted in an altered enzyme. And this enzyme is responsible for change in clearance, okay? So if this happens, then the alterations in the DNA affect the clearance of the drug, which affects the pharmacokinetics of the drug and how the drug behaves. And when clearance is different, I have usually I need to alter those modifications in order to be able to um, um, get the same AUC or the same effect, right? Um, if another uh, Elena suggested that it has to do with response, with drug response. And this is also true, because if it, if it does have to do with the drug response, then basically uh, the, the alterations here results in a different receptor, for example, or a different uh, uh, ion channel formation. And this ion channel or receptor now exhibit different functionality. And because of the different functionality of this receptor or of this um, uh, ion channel or whatsoever, the dynamics of the drugs are different. So we see uh, more sensitivity, less sensitivity, no sensitivity whatsoever to this specific medication. As such, those changing and maybe therapeutic changes altogether are deemed, are, are deemed necessary at this stage. Okay, so when we say pharmacogenetics, it's the study of the effect of variations in the DNA sequence on the drug response, whether at the PK level, when it relates to metabolism and clearance, or at the PD level, pharmacodynamics level, when it re relates to activity or efficacy uh, or side effects of the drug. Okay. There is a slight variation between the term pharmacogenetics and pharmacogenomics, okay? And this slight variability um, relates to how many genes are we talking about. So when we're talking about a SNP or a single polymorphism or a single gene alteration, then we're talking about pharmacogenetics. But when we're talking about a group of genes or the whole genome, alterations, then we're talking about pharmacogenomics. So sort of pharmacogenomics is a bigger uh, um, uh, perspective uh, uh, of how to define this thing, or alterations. But um, in reality, they are used very much interchangeably. But when you're coming to the appropriate terminology, what is pharmacogenetics and what is pharmacogenomics? Pharmacogenomics looks at a, a broader perspective, the whole alterations of the bigger genome, whereas pharmacogenetics looks at uh, single genes, single gene alterations. Okay, so now that we know that any alterations in the gene, and we, now how can we, why is this science so new? We know the pharmacokinetics like since forever. We know the pharmacodynamics since forever. Why is this so new? Actually, it's not that new because um, in, in real life, the precision medicine or the, or the pharmacogenomics or, or 
it's, it's actually, or, or the idea of personalizing the medication is actually an old idea because we have seen that some patients um, need lower doses, some other patients need higher doses, some other patients are really very sensitive to specific medications. And we used to act towards that, but we didn't have enough background knowledge to be able to um, uh, figure out the reason why is this happening. And now with the, with the technology that is happening all over, we have the knowledge of the DNA sequences. Now we can um, um, uh, define that and we can interpret that into actually gene alterations, etc. Okay, And this truly totally what relates the ADMI, absorption, distribution, metabolism, elimination. So any alteration, any part of those enzyme, uh, transporter, um, 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 clearance, uh, anything that relates to that actually changes the PK. Anything that relates to PD changes that. This is a, a figure that I did with uh, some undergraduate, um, UVA undergraduates. It was a research project that we did together, Amy and Riyadh. I think now they are in, grade, in uh, year four. And, um, and basically, um, um, this shows the listed medications within the FDA that require those modifications due to pharmacogenomics reasons. So as you see, in oncology, I have 102 medications. In neurology, 18. In infectious diseases, I have 29. In psychiatry, I have 33. Cardiology, I have 15. So I have medications that actually, based on the genetic data of the patient, requires those modifications. For some patients, they are not supposed to take those drugs altogether if they carry a specific gene. For other patients, they, are, they require lesser doses or higher doses, or maybe there is a totally therapeutic failure if they carry a certain gene and they take specific medication. So as you see, those are, this is uh, quite a lump sum. Even on, at community level, I have to be aware of what's going on. Okay, so what is the role of DNA? Why, when, why would I say uh, when there is DNA alterations, I expect to see some differences in PK and PD? What is DNA? What am I doing with DNA? Why are we using the DNA? Okay. Excellent. So it's a coding. It's a coding thing. It's polymorphism in metabolizing design. Cause the proteins and effect. Excellent. So basically DNA, 98% or 99% of the DNA, the knowledge, today's knowledge is unaware of what it is used for. We, we, we cannot link it to any specific coding. We managed successfully in the, until year 2020 to code or to interpret uh, what one to 2% of the DNA is coding. And we call this coding regions. The blue ones here, the exons are called the coding regions. The entrants, the bigger portions in here, are coding non-coding regions. We still don't know what they are doing. They are actually helping somehow with the coding as well, but until now, the exact functionality of those entrants is not known. So we only know that 1% to 2% are, are as coding. So imagine that you have the code, or you have the blueprint, and you want the enzymes, we know they have a lifespan. The receptors, they have a lifespan. New things need to be regenerated. Every time I need to regenerate an enzyme or regenerate something, I go back to the code and I interpret that back into some proteins and those proteins act as the enzymes, structural elements, signaling molecules, and those have lifespan, they die, and I go back to the, printing, the blueprint and I print more. The printing occurs through a process of what we call transcription and translation, okay? So in the trans internet transcription, the exons, the, as, um, the aligned exons are coming together. And then after that, they are translating, forming what we call messenger RNA. And then after that, they are translated into the protein, functional protein that we require, okay? If during the transcription or translation, mutation occur, and there are different sorts of mutation. There could be what we call SNP, which is single nucleotide polymorphism. So instead of the um, uh, adenine, we get, for example, D. Um, 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 instead of the A, we get the G. Instead of the T, we get the C. Okay, so some, some sort of an alteration, whether it's in, in, in sequencing or in interpretation, um, this is what we call single nucleotide polymorphism. So at a nucleotide level. 
There are insertions and deletions. There are variable number tandem repeats, copy number variants. This is not, today is not the lecture that we're gonna discuss that. We don't have that much time to do that. Uh, the haplotype, so there are different sorts of polymorphisms. Today we're gonna focus at what we call the SNP. And what is SNP? SNP is a single nucleotide polymorphism. When actually there is a single, uh, single change in one nucleotide, we call that single nucleotide variant or SNV. So it's a variant, one variant, okay? But as I mentioned, we're not dealing with every single variant, you know, that will be rational. Do you want me to, to track every single mistake that happened within a transcription and translation that happens zillions of time every day for zillions of people? And I have to go and run after each patient and change the therapy based on that? It doesn't make sense. So when the single nucleotide variant becomes so common that it is, exists in one to two percent, at least one to two percent of the population, Okay, now we consider this single variant, it's not a haphazard mistake, uh, and actually we need to consider that. And we call that single nucleotide polymorphism. So when you hear the word SNP, or single nucleotide polymorphism, that's a single variant. So it's a single variant at one nucleotide level that is actually so common that it became to be common between one to 2% of the population. And now it became important, especially if it relates to some other functionality, okay? The SNP can happen in a coding or a non-coding area, and the SNP can result in functional or non-functional errors, okay? Now, let's imagine that we have enzymes, okay? And, and uh, let's see if the, uh, uh, if the enzymes have polymorphisms, okay? So, let me show you something. We said that the polymorphism can happen at any protein synthesized. So it could be an enzyme, it could be a receptor, it could be other things, right? Signaling uh, molecules, other things. Let's talk about enzymes for now. So let's say we know that the enzymes are responsible for the clearance, okay? So let's say that this is the main enzyme responsible for the clearance. Clearance, you see now, let me do it. So we know that clearance equal dose by AUC, right? So what happens if the enzyme became um, super functional all of a sudden? So the enzyme that is responsible for the elimination of this drug become super functional. It does super function. What happens here? Exactly. But before saying decrease AUC, you jumped, Megan, you jumped a few steps. So when the, when the enzymes become, exactly, clearance increase. And as such, since, since clearance is going to increase, the AUC is going to drop, as Megan mentioned, and to prevent this from happening, because as the AUC drops, it can drop below the therapeutic uh, activity level that is required for this specific medication. So in order to change that, we have to change the dose, which would be by increasing or decreasing the dose if the clearance increase. Increasing the dose, exactly, okay? So, if vice versa, if we are dealing with a, a, a functionality change that results in no clearance whatsoever, the, the enzymes are non-functional at all. So the clearance actually decreases or becomes null. In this cases, we either have to decrease the dose or we have to change the therapy altogether in order to be able to um, get uh, the same AUC, okay? Um, now, if the AUC increases, what I'm going to see? If the AUC, if the, if the availability of the drug, if the drug concentrations increases inside the body, more toxicity, exactly, more side effects. So I can see effects and side effects, or I can see side effects by themselves, depending on how high is the level that the drug reached. If actually the AUC decreased, then what's happening? Less effect, and if it increases below the therapeutic level, I would see no effect, so efficacy is affected. So, by, so here, the, the changes in functionality is affecting the medication efficacy. And that's why we say we need to interpret that correctly in, in order and see the clinical guidelines in order to be able to keep or maintain the safety and efficacy of the medication. 
when we talk about pharmacogenomics and its effect on the PK and the PD, we're actually talking medication efficacy and safety. Now, another question. Does this change if we're dealing with a drug and a pro-drug, or is it the same? Opposite, exactly, exactly, Anna. So basically, what, what we just explained for a drug, the opposite is gonna be happening if we're dealing with a pro-drug. So if we're dealing with a pro-drug, if we have more clearance, we're getting more toxicity and more side effects, and we're getting less clearance, then basically we're getting no effect. Thank you so much. Yeah. So this is basically what I wanted to discuss at this level, okay? Now let's get a few more terms to what we just described, okay? So we have the enzyme, the, the normal enzyme, we call it extensive metabolizer. So when you hear the term extensive metabolizers, that's the enzyme uh, or the, 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 the wild type. So you will hear something that is called wild type, okay? So let me just, okay. so there is the wild type. Okay, and there, each polymorphism results in something that we call alleles. Okay, so each polymorphism results into alleles. And alleles are, for example, we say 2C9, and then we say allele denoted as asterisk, and allele, for example, 1. So allele 1 has a specific genetic structure. Okay, uh, another one, another polymorphism results in allele 2. If allele 1 and 2 are of normal activity, we call those wild types, and those are normal metabolites. Each one of us from each enzyme carry two forms, okay, carry two forms, one inherited from the mother and one inherited from the father. So, if any, so for any, um, um, to figure out the DNA of a person, you will find 2C9, for example, allele 1 slash allele 4, okay? And then you have to figure out, for example, allele 1 is a normal type, is it a poor metabolizer, is it an extensive metabolizer, and allele 4 is which one of them, and so if he carries one working and one non-working, is he now an intermediate metabolizer? If he carries two working, is he now like super metabolizer? If you understand what I mean? So basically it's the sum of the two alleles, sum of the two functionalities, okay? Those are all terminologies to understand when we go further, okay? So when we say there is a polymorphism, polymorphism results in what we call alleles, okay? The different forms of the enzymes, those are alleles. Alleles are denoted by asterisk and a number, or a number and a letter, okay? And each one of us, for each enzyme or for each um, thing, he carries two forms, one inherited from the mother and one inherited from the father, okay? So this is a description for, for something like that. So let's go back to the terminologies again. And we see here, so we have the normal or extensive, so when you hear extensive metabolizer, EM or NM, that's an enzyme with a normal functionality, okay? And so basically this one is the one that based on which most of the doses, most of the empiric doses, this is based on that. And usually no changes in rare conditions in normal functionality enzymes, we need to change those. But in, in, in reality, this is the wild type, this is the norm, okay? Now, if a person carries one functional and one, fu one non-functional allele, he becomes an intermediate metabolizer. And here the functionality is lessened, okay? And depending on the clinical data and the clinical uh, evidence that we have and the clinical guidelines, we need whether to, to change the dose or not to change the dose. But we understand what are the expectations. If we're dealing with a drug, intermediate metabolizer means that less clearance, means higher AUC, maybe I need to adjust the dose a little. And depending on the toxicity and the therapeutic window and a lot of other parameters, the intervention occurs. The poor metabolizers, th this is a person who usually carries two non-functional alleles, okay? Two non-functional forms of the enzyme. And it shows slow metabolism. Uh, um, it, it usually there are huge side effects and sometimes the, the medication has to go down to 50% less or even the therapy has to be changed altogether. In the ultra-rapid metabolizers, those are uh, usually one normal and one rapid or two rapid metabolizers alleles that the person carries. And here there is a risk of uh, non-efficacy, okay? So now we are aware of those terms. We know of the poor metabolizer, intermediate metabolizer, extensive or normal metabolizer, and ultra-rapid metabolizer. And sometimes they call it rapid and ultra-rapid in some definitions. So they divide it into two categories, ultra-rapid and rapid. Now, analgesics. What sorts of analgesics do we have in the market? What sorts of analgesics?
what sorts of analgesics do we have in the market? Okay, we have opioids and non-opioids, that's bigger categories, right? So when a person comes in pain in a pharmacy, what do you usually do? What do you usually start with? We start with the non-opioids, for sure. We start with the non-opioids. We give the whatever the this has safety uh, OTC products, exactly. And we have to assess. We have to assess the patients and, 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 and look into that. Assess the pain, exactly, um, properly. Yes, assess the pain level and type. And after we assess the pain level and type, we start with the uh, one with the biggest, uh, um, like most effective to this sort of pain. So, for example, pain number three is not like pain number 10. I have to deal with the with the sort of pain, and um, okay. What are the what are the general things that we tell the patients once they come into the pharmacy about safety parameters and stuff like that? So, if I'm counseling about Tylenol, what are the things that I need to warn the patient of? Maximum dosage of Tylenol. Yes. Okay. Uh, if I'm if I'm talking about uh, aspirin, what I'm uh, what I'm dealing with the patients. side effects and, and check if uh, GI upset, okay? And GI upset also applies for what? For the NSAIDs, for all NSAIDs. Yes, GI upset is, is a common thing for all NSAIDs. And NSAIDs also has other side effects as? Other, other than the GI upset. They do affect the kidney somehow, right? Yes, hypertension, cardiovascular risk, increased blood pressure through affecting certain certain pathways in the kidney as well, right? And and uh, and this is how they do some of the effects. And you're going to be told that. In, and what other side effects? Dizziness. And um, they they also cause some dizziness for some patients. Okay, as a side effect. Ulcers, for sure, it comes back to the GI uh, upset, and yes. And um, okay, so this is the, the NSAIDs, okay. If we move to the opioids, as pharmacists, what do we need to discuss with the patients? What are the side effects of the opioids? Constipation, yes, constipation. And for people who have already history of constipation, we need to give something preventive, especially if they are starting a high dose, for example, bone fractures or something like that. Respiratory depression is one of the most important. Uh, sedation, drowsiness, dizziness, especially if they are operating uh, heavy machinery. I have always to, to counsel the patient and if, especially if they are naive patients that they need to watch out. Um, if they are elderly population, what else do I need to do? Talk about the dizziness and drowsiness in terms of stairs, in terms of falls, in terms of, right? Because, you know, so I have to incorporate things as well in, in what, what um, in my decision or my discussion with those patients. Um, exactly, and other substance that causes other CNS depression in order not to increase the CNS depression. So all those are side effects of the opioids, right? Um, um, what other things that are happening when we are dealing with the opioids in the pharmacy recently uh, implemented, not that recent, but sort of recently implemented, the college implemented a few things in the practice when it relates to opioids, opioids dispension. Anybody? How to use naloxone? Yes, of course, naloxone is, yes, okay. Uh, okay, yes, yeah, exactly. The crudine liquid now is in, on a triplicate, yes. The extension, exactly. Extension is one of the things. I was gonna head into the extension thing, addiction. Okay, in dispensing an opioid, a couple of years back, the college went up and asked us to do some sort of monitoring to that, so to calculate the morphine equivalent through certain calculators, so you go online and write a morphine equivalent, and there is a minimum for a naive patient, there is a, a value that they shouldn't exceed when they start on uh, whatever, anything of the opioid. So we calculate something that we call the morphine equivalent, and based on the morphine equivalent, we calculate whether the dose is too much for the patient, especially if they are naive patients or not. We have also to visit the net care, make sure that they are not, um, 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 they are not basically um, uh, taking it soon enough or you know the frequency of the use um, if there are any overuse addiction as Leonardo have mentioned over here and um, 
and until very recent, we were very much tight when it relates to dispensing anything related to the opioids. When the COVID hit in and when the doctors had, you know, um, um, access was a little bit of a challenging for the, for the patients, the pharmacist uh, got some um, um, more power to extend some of the opioids. Okay, so now we can extend. We cannot initiate opioid therapy, but we can extend the opioid therapy. Okay, so, so those are things that are happening outside. So basically, even with the opioids, there are a lot of regulations, a lot of ethics, um, a lot of rules happening out there. And if this gives you any indications, it tells you that the dose of this opioids is too much to monitor. It's very important to see the effects. It's very important to see the side effects, the drug interactions. Uh, with other medications, um, uh, drug disease interactions, when we talk about blood pressure and, and NSAIDs, for example. Um, you know, so, so this, this all relates to the importance of what we're doing today. So if I know that a certain uh, a patient is getting effects or no effects from those medications, part of it could be an inter-individual variability. Inter-individual variability is very much interpreted with what we're doing. Okay. Um, opioids, when we're talking about opioids and analgesic, we're looking about two things happening through them. Uh, elimination, and elimination happen, ha ha happen mostly through hepatic elimination, phase one and phase two enzymes. The most uh, enzymes that are involved into the uh, hepatic elimination is the 2D6, the 3E4, and the phase two UGT 2B7. Okay? Um, also, um, there is the COMT, okay? and those enzymes are, are well known to have different alleles, different polymorphisms with different functionalities. So if I know that, I know that those are among the medications that if a patient carries a, a different allele, they might require a different um, um, therapy levels, okay, different doses, okay. Um, the other part would be the opioid receptors. And the opioid receptors are now known as uh, OPRM1, which is the mu, mu receptors. Delta receptors, OPRD1, and kappa receptors, OPRK1, okay? And we have the P-glycoprotein, the ABCB1, okay? So at a PK level and at a PD levels, those, this is how the opioids exhibit their activity. So as whether the clearance of them are changed due to difference in polymorphisms, or whether at the receptors level, they are, the activity is changed, or at the transporter level, the, 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 the activity is changed. So in order to be able to judge whether I need uh, um, the inter-individual variability or whether a specific polymorphism is gonna affect me or affect this medication or not, I have to actually go deep into the details of its um, uh, trip within the body, its PK and PD um, diagnostics. So for example, codeine, codeine is a drug or a prodrug? Codeine is a drug or a prodrug? Codeine is a prodrug, so by itself is not a drug, doesn't it do, doesn't do anything. It has to be changed into morphine in order to be able to exhibit its activity, okay? So this happens through phase one, 2D6, okay? After the morphine is formed, which is the active entity inside the body, it is, again, goes to phase two, okay? And it changed, one of them is active and one of them is inactive, okay? So one, one of the further metabolites has pursued activity and the other does not. Hydrocodone, the same thing, okay? It turns into the hydromorphone, which is the active form, and another active form. Oxycodone, the same thing, so oxymorphone and noroxymorphone, and then inactive metabolites. So it's very, it's very, the morphine is the active entity. It doesn't go through phase one, it goes directly through phase two, and it goes into morphine six glucuronide. So basically, as we see here, I really need to understand the pathway of this medication inside the body in order to be able to assess the symptoms that the patient is coming for me, whether it is inactivity, they are taking the codeine and it's totally inactive. They are taking codeine, they're increasing doses and it's inactive. This gives me an indication there is something wrong with this patient. Why is he taking this high doses of codeine and no activity is happening? And what, is, what should be my recommendation to overcome that based on my knowledge? Okay. Um, the fentanyl is the active entity changed into norfentanyl. Methadone changes into inactive entity. Okay. okay, now let's see where should I look or how would I know about any of those medications. There is something called CPIC and there is something called PharmGKB. So let's get out of here. I want you to start looking with me, okay? So we'll go and write CPIC. 
Okay. Here you go, CPIC and pharmacogenomics. Okay, so here it is. And what does CPIC stands for? It's the Clinical Pharmacogenetics Implementation Constraint. And here we can find some uh, evidence. Um, so basically those are clinical guidelines based on evidence, okay? So let's try to look into something. So we have guidelines in here. Okay. And here you will find all the guidelines related to specific medications. For example, 2C19 and clopidogrel, 2C9 and NSAIDs, okay? Uh, 2C9 and HLEV1 phenytoin, and so on, so on. So basically you choose any one of those. So we can choose this one, for example, and you will find a publication similar to some of the publications that I shared with you. And those publications are based on not one single uh, trial or two single tri or two trials or three trials. Basically they collect data from different trials and they come up with regulations. And those regulations are updated year by year or every two th years or every three years. The more evidence are there in the market, the more the clinical data are based on stronger evidence, and you will see that as we go forward. So this is one thing, okay? The other thing would be the Farm GKV, Farm GKV, okay? And in the Farm GKV, this is what we call the, like shop all thing. When we say, for example, if we say ibuprofen, Okay. Now we come with what we call clinical guideline annotation, clinical annotation, variant annotations, and then let's go for the clinical guideline annotation. And you will find here some evidence, some, okay, so the gene is the 2C9. So any alterations in the 2C9, any alterations in the 2C8, and this is the uh, annotations of the CAPIC guideline of diclofenac ibuprofen, okay. Here it says no recommendation, so we don't have enough evidence. If we go back and we choose the clinical annotations in here, it gives you levels of evidence as well. So we have level 1A, we have level 3, we have level 2, and each level of those carries specific like how strong it is. Okay? There, are, there, there are different uh, regulating of bodies, so it's not only the CPIC that gives the regulation. We also have um, um, Deutsch or Dutch, a regulatory agency. So let's say, let's put the CUDA in here instead of the morphine. Okay, and let's put here. And you will find here a few things, okay? We have the 2D6 by the, C, the CPNDS. This is Canadian Pharmacogenomic Network for Drug Safety by the CPIC, by the Clinical Pharmacogenetics Implementation Constrillium. CPIC is the widely known, okay? And we have the DPWG, the Dutch Pharmacogenetic Working Group. So we have different working groups, okay? We have different working groups and each working group issues regula regulatory agents and those all can be reached through the Farm GKB, okay? So if we want to study about the codeine, or we want to know about the recent guidelines related to pharmacogenomics when it relates to codeine, we have to open the PharmGKB, open whatever, if you want to check the CPIC or check the Dutch pharmacogenetics group work and come up with the guidelines or the recommendations they are telling me about. If I go and I want to check how, how, how strong are those evidences, I go back to the clinical annotation and it will give me a level. Like, is it like this is based on only single study, two, two studies, three studies? Or this is something that has been so common right now that, you know, we have very strong evidence. Usually the 1A, the 1B are the strongest evidence. And those are the ones that actually require modifications. The rest are some sort of, we have evidence, but it's not as strong for us to give comfortably a, a strong decision about therapy treatments. Okay, so here we go. Okay, so let's start by the uh, opioid analgesic, the, the codeine, okay? And I want you to put it up uh, through the Farm GKB and open the CPIC guidelines. So do, do similar to what I just did, open the Farm GKB, okay? And from the Farm GKB, choose the clinical annotations decision. So go 
go to farm G, A, B, here, and write codeine, and choose the clinical guidelines annotation. Okay, we are going to work with the CPIC. And for example, if I give you a question, you have to be very careful which question am I asking? Am I asking based on the Dutch or am I asking based on the CPIC or am I asking based on what? To which guidelines am I asking you to give me the recommendation based upon? Because there are sometimes slight differences between one guideline or one uh, uh, body and the other in terms of the guidelines and the therapy management. So I'm going to go to read now here. And as you see, because it's one place shop all, it, it's we, we know that, yeah, these questions. No, I haven't heard about the Gen XYS. If you have a, a, a link to that, you can send it to us and we can look at it uh, up, Christina. I didn't work with that before, but it would be nice to see what is that. Okay, so here, as we mentioned, the CYP2D6, okay, Every person has two alleles. So for example, if I have a patient and uh, I get to know their, um, 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 that they, I mean, their genetic mapping, okay? Great, thank you, Christina. Um, and I get to know the genetic mapping, okay? Then basically what we have here is, we're gonna write it over here. So 2D6, 8, for example, and 2D6, 6. Okay, the activity score is zero. When the activity score is zero, that means what? Activity, when the activity score is one, that means that it is the wild type. When the activity score is 1.5 or two, that means that it is the ultra rapid. When the activity score is zero, that means that it is the poor metabolizer. So here it says that activity score for those is zero and it's poor metabolizers. So an individual carrying no functional alleles. So both alleles are non-functional. The eight and the six are non-functional. Okay, and based on such, for this specific patient, we recommend the following. We recommend to avoid the codeine use. Codeine is a prodrug. So if I don't have a 2D6 to transform it into the morphine, the patient would be taking the codeine, but would be eliminating it as codeine as well, because it's, it's never gonna move to morphine form. Okay, and because it's never gonna turn into the active entity, it's useless for them to use this medication. Okay, now I'm gonna tell the patient, that basically if he takes the codeine, I'm gonna tell the doctor that he doesn't have to take codeine because he cannot transform it back into morphine. The morphine equivalent dose here is zero. So what would you recommend for such a patient? What would be the appropriate recommendation here? Different drug like, like what? Different drug like what? When the doctor prescribed morphine, exactly, exactly. Take the, take the drug as such, don't take it as a pro-drug. Don't take it as a pro-drug or take an opioid or take an opioid or take another opioid that is not metabolized by the 2D6 because I know that the 2D6 is not functional for this patient. Take another opioid that is not metabolized or don't take a pro-drug that is metabolized by the 2D6 because if you do, basically you're falling into the same problem again. Okay, so those, those are the, the, rational, the rational suggestions in here, okay? I can use other things. Okay, now let's see here. Those are videos. Do you hear that? Because I know I had to do something that you have to hear. Uh, okay. I won't waste time over here. We don't have that much time, but I want you to listen to this video. It tells you a little bit about what we're just going to cover right now. Okay, so we said that it is through the 2D6 that it's moved to the morphine. So if the 2D6 is non-functional, there is no morphine happening. And then there is another active metabolite by the phase two metabolism, okay? So for the ultra rapid metabolizers, what should I expect here? If, I, if the 2D6 is an ultra rapid, increase the formation of morphine, increase the risk of toxicity. So if I'm calculating the dose that the morphine equivalent for this specific medication would be X, in fact, 
the, the morphine equivalent is not calculated properly because he's an ultra metabolizer. A lot of morphine is going to be formed and at once because this is going to happen very quick. Okay, um, so basically I need to increase the dose, decrease the dose, change the therapy if something like this is happening. With the ultra metabolizer, I don't necessarily need to change to, to change therapy altogether. I'd rather decrease the dose. I'd rather decrease the dose. Okay, but when we're talking about the poor metabolizers, that's 100% correct. Then we need to change the therapy. It's safer to change the therapy. Now, it's not, it's not up to how Dalia feel comfortable with, or how Amy feel comfortable with, how Christina feel comfortable with, how Olivia feel comfortable with, okay? It's all about guidelines, and it's all about um, clinical evidence that is out there in the market, and how those group of uh, researchers decided what to do. You can have an assumption that makes sense to you or doesn't make sense to you. Because for example, if there is a typo error, if there is something wrong with the guidelines, if there is a problem with whatever is coming to you as information, your mind needs to assess. So what we are describing, the, the hows and the whys and, and all those things is to give you a sense of judgment, how to think towards it. But when it comes to dosing, and, uh, and, and, and therapy change and stuff like that, it doesn't come to my comfort level, it comes to evidence-based results and evidence-based therapy and clinical guidelines, okay? So when it comes to that, I have to stick to something, CPIC, Dutch, and I have to have an evidence for that, okay? Similar to when I do, to, if I wanna check, for example, the dose for a certain patient, is it within the limit? Have I reached the toxic level yet? Can they increase the dose or not? What is the frequency of use? I have to go and check with the reference. This one here tells you about the things we, we were just discussing, the activity value. So when I have an increased function, that means the activity value above the one. And those are examples of alleles that are of ultra rapid or rapid metabolism. Normal or increased activity from between the one and one and above the one, okay? The normal function is the one, the decreased function is the 0.5, and those are the alleles that are known to give such functionality, okay? No function, those are the alleles for that. Unknown, those are the rest of the alleles, okay? And this is up to today's knowledge. Tomorrow, different knowledge could be out there. We can discover further alleles. We can discover further things that we don't know. Technology, every day is changing, and that's why the guidelines are updated. Okay, so this is another table with a similar information. Okay, 2D6 is not just for opioid analgesics. 2D6 is wide uh, uh, involved in the metabolism of different medications. So in antidepressants, in antiemetics, in antipsychotics, um, some beta blockers, some other medications. So if I know that this patient has an issue with the 2D6, despite I discovered that when I was dealing with um, opioid therapy, I have to start interpreting that and revisiting this patient's medications because 2D6 is actually involved in other things. So even if I don't have clinical evidence or I don't have clinical guidelines that I need to change any of those therapy, I need to keep that in mind and put it clearly in the patient's profile for me and for the doctor for any future possible therapy change that the patient is going to go through. For example, he is going to be on coming one day and using the ondansetron. I know that the ondansetron, and he's a poor metabolizer, I know that some, something wrong is going to happen. Okay, so I have to either check the dose or maybe not put him on a dance room altogether, put him on something else. You understand what I mean? So, so once you figure out that there is an issue with one of the alleles, you have to keep that handy because this is to be applied on every future medication, everything else, because one enzyme does not relate only to one drug. Okay. Upon checking the farm GKB, we find this is the final table that tells you the guidelines, okay? And which this uh, cheat sheet, basically, if you add the alleles, will tell you what to do. But the guidelines are here. So if we have an ultra rapid metabolizer, we need to avoid codeine use, okay? And the evidence here is strong. If we have an extensive metabolizer, which is a normal or to so EM or NM, we use the empiric dosing or we use the labeled recommended dosing. If we have an intermediate metabolizers, uh, we can decrease, uh, sorry, this would reduce the morphine formation. So basically we start by the labeled use and we titrate the dose up to until we, we see the activity or until we see the efficacy. Or if we are worried about that, we can change therapy. 
okay? So, but with the intermediate, it's not, it's not suggested just to change the dose right away or to change the therapy right away. Um, uh, that's a very good question, Dimitri. The, 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 the things, there are some um, um, kits that are available now in the market and some people um, uh, do it in the hospital if they are on warfarin or if they are on like um, oncology, some oncology medications. But in, 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 in normal, this is what we are actually advocating for. This is what we are advocating that pharmacists take this rule. They do the commercial kits or they do kits for those patients. And eventually we need this data because it's important for therapeutic management. Until now, people do it voluntary because it costs a lot of money. It costs between 200 to 450, 500 dollars to get you know about seven, eight, ten alleles of those patients. And then there comes the ethical question: When should it be done? Who should take the question for it? There are a lot of. This is why we're saying within your courses in the next couple of years, we'll be kicking in every once in a while and give you another piece of the puzzle when it relates to pharmacogenomics. So, what are the testing techniques? Uh, what are the paperwork related to that? What are the ethical guidelines? Today, I'm just talking about the application when it relates to the opioids and non-opioids. So, okay, so for the intermediate metabolizers, uh, the evidence is, is moderate, but I don't have um, um, strong evidence. Tramadol, if you, if you see in the, in the tramadol things, tramadol also is a prodrug. And, uh, and also it is uh, metabolized by the 2D6. But because it's an intermediate metabolizer, maybe the codeine doesn't work, but the tramadol does work. So again, if you're using the tramadol, you have to monitor for the therapy as well, because the same thing can still apply, okay? Now, for poor metabolizers, this is a greatly reduced morphine formation. We have to avoid the codeine altogether. And here, as your friends have mentioned, to use um, um, morphine or non-opioid analgesics, or to use other uh, um, um, opioids that are not pro-drugs or that are not uh, metabolized by the 2D6. So this is the guideline, okay? Now let's have, let's have a, a, a case. So a patient appears with a T4 prescription in your pharmacy, okay? So uh, when you discuss with him and you check the history, you find that he has been on the T3 for several times and increased the dose for the T3 and the pain is not manageable. And because the uh, scare of the toxicity from the acetaminophen, the doctor moved him to the T4. So basically, he's taking a very high doses of codeine right now. And in a few days, he appears again, uh, um, but with a just codeine dose, doses, like codeine 30 milligram tablets or something like that. And, um, and still the pain is not complete. Would you recommend the pharmacogenomic testing for this patient or not, and why? If it was feasible, if it was covered, or if he doesn't mind paying for it, if the money is not a, a, an issue for this thing, would you recommend the pharmacogenetic dosing for this, for the testing for this patient? Yes, exactly. It makes sense. There is something wrong. The, the, there is inter-individual variability here, and the codeine obviously is not functional. And because the 2D6 is into a lot of other medications, not just the codeine, it would be very well uh, um, um, informative for this patient to get to know uh, um, the readings for that, okay? So if his PGX results came like that, so he did the pharmacogenomics testing and the PGX results came like that, 4-7, 117, 1, 1, and VKROC AE, which of those genes do I need to look at? Which of those genes do I need to search? 2D6. The 2D6. 2D6. Exactly. So we're going to go back to the cheat sheet over here. And can somebody tell me the numbers? It was four? 17. And 17. I think it was just seven. It was totally actually seven. Thanks, Keely. OK, so it was seven. Okay. OK, so he's a poor metabolizer. And it makes sense that he's a poor metabolizer, okay? And, and as such, we have to change. The, the, second, uh, the second option that I gave you, what if the 2D6 was four and nine? So four and nine, okay? Now he is an intermediate metabolizer, okay? If he's an intermediate metabolizer, that's reduced morphine formation. So basically in that cases we have to increase, but now that we have seen him increasing such doses, 
we know that this is not going to be effective. So what is the recommendation? What would be the recommendation in here? Change, change to morphine or non-opioids or another uh, 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 opioid that is not metabolized by the 2D6, okay? Now, knowing the mechanism of action of codeine, what other thing are we missing in here? What other factor can we think about? For example, if the 2D6 came normal or just an intermediate and he's still not seeing activity, what else? When we spoke about the opioids and we spoke about the things that affect them, what else can, could have happened in here? What else could have polymorphisms that could have resulted in no activity for the codeine? We have the PK and we have the PD. Mu receptors polymorphisms, exactly. If we have mu receptors polymorphisms that are less sensitive to the codeine, for example, this also can have some things. And then we have to revisit. But as you saw, when we put the codeine on the farm GKB, we don't have enough clinical evidence now or evidence-based decision, clinical decision-making to change therapy based on mu receptors alterations. But there are, if you look, and I, and I have attached some of the uh, papers talking about receptors polymorphisms and how do they affect the therapy and what are the expectations. So here it comes to personal judgment, it comes to discussion with the doctor that because the mu receptors, and by the way, the, um, the, um, the kits, that are out there, the commercial kits have the new receptors among them. So we can know the, uh, the allele or the polymorphism in the new receptors. Okay, or the, yes, or the other, exactly, or the other, the phase two uh, enzymes, but phase two is not, as you mentioned, as you saw when we, when we looked at the clinical guidelines, even if phase two has, uh, has changed, it's not as effective as much. Mainly the new receptors, this is where the new research is heading, and mainly the 2D6 when it comes to the specific I know we're a little bit above time, but okay, I'm gonna jump into here. What I want you to do to see the difference between the CPIC and the DPWG, go ahead into the website I showed you and open the DPWG and you will see here in the DPWG, the Dutch guidelines, they are actually getting deeper and showing the difference when, it, when the codeine is used actually for cuff, when it's used for pain, when it's used for different entities, and they are giving you different guidelines based on the use as well, okay? So the DPWG actually went a little bit deeper. The CPIG is more well-known and it's easier to use and interpret, but the DPWG added a little bit when it, codeine is actually not used for pain. So I'm not, I cannot just substitute it for morphine. When codeine is used as a cough suppressant, what should I do in here? What are the guidelines when it relates to that, okay? Uh, for the non-opioid analgesic, I want you to visit the farm GKB. If you can open it right now with me. And you will find that it relates to the 2C9. Oh, okay. I apologize. I apologize. Yes, of course. Um, it's just the 2C9. And as you see, the 2C9 is also involved in other things. Okay. And... Basically, I wasn't going to add much. I was going to go through the alleles of the two uh, of the of the two C9s and the the uh, where it is, and basically the the guidelines like what is the activity score, and then when it's NSAIDs, what are the recommendations? But you can do this at your own time if you want. When it's two C9 and the NSAIDs, when it's poor metabolizers, I have to initiate the therapy between 25 to 50 percent, okay? And when it is intermediate metabolizers. Uh, I start with the lowest recommended doses and I adjust accordingly, okay? Um, and here is a patient with uh, ibuprofen 400 milligram and she is showing uh, side effects, okay? And when you look at this patient, this was what uh, important in here because this patient, this is, the, this is one of the kits that come in the market. So these are the results that actually come to you when you're doing it. So this is the mu receptor in here. This is the 2D6, 2C19, 2C9, and the phenotype of each, okay? So basically, if you get a, 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 a map like that for this specific patient, you can decide what you need to do, okay? I'm not gonna uh, delay you more than that. I really apologize upon that. But I mean, look into this. If you don't understand it, email me, because this is basically how you're gonna see a, a, a results for a patient, and we need to be understanding and um, visit the compare between the codeine and the uh, in the two uh, guidelines okay 
And thank you so much. I really enjoyed uh, lecturing you. I apologize. I know I gave a lot of information in very short time. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Have a very good day. And